tact. Tact is a keen sense of what to do or what to say in order to maintain good relations with others and avoid offending others. Choose your words wisely, especially when you're in a potentially uh, a f conflicting uh, time in your life. Your words may strike the tone of a peacemaker, or your words can strike the tone of uh, stirring up anger or causing trouble, if you will. In that case, that makes you a troublemaker. The key to choosing words wisely, I think, is thinking before you speak. All too often, people speak before they think. A person who is tactful is normally empathetic. They, they have the ability to place themselves in the shoes or the situation, if you will, of others. A person who has no empathy for others uh, likely doesn't have any tact either. People with no tact often stir up trouble, uh, more so than those who are peacemakers or problem solvers. If you have tact, you probably are a peacemaker or a problem solver. Gideon, uh, one of the judges of Israel, was very tactful. He, he, he could read situations and knew what to say or what to do that would ease tensions among others. Uh, Gideon and 300 very brave men and the Lord had just defeated the Midianites and their allies and you would think that the, all the other people of Israel would be happy campers. Well, the men of Ephraim aren't happy campers. We're going to pick it up today in Judges chapter 8, verse 1. You can be opening your Bibles there as we ask that word of wisdom in Yeshua's precious name. Father, we ask you to open eyes, open ears this day. Now, Gideon had sent messengers. They, put, uh, they took 300 of them, took on 135,000 of the enemy. It's a good thing the Lord was with them because that's insurmountable odds. But that's what the Lord wanted. He said, you got too many men, Gideon. 20,000 is too many. I want you to reduce that. Send those who are cowards home. And he did. And then that brought him down to 10,000. The Lord said, that's still too many, Gideon. Uh, I'm going to choose out 300, and you're going to take on 135,000. Because I want you to realize it's not by your own strength that you're defeating the Midianites. It's the strength of the Lord. But Gideon and his 300 put the armies to shame of, of the, uh, the Ammonites. And uh, what we saw then was the Midianites, I should say. And what we saw there was Gideon put them on the run, and they were running for the Jordan River, trying to get back on the east side of Jordan. Uh, Gideon sent messengers to the people of Ephraim and said, they're on the run, head them off at the pass. Don't let them pass uh, over Jordan. And the Ephraimites uh, captured uh, Oreb and Zeb, two of the princes of the Midianites. And that's where we pick it up, uh, chapter 8, verse 1, and it reads, And the men of Ephraim said unto him, Why hast thou served us thus? The him here is Gideon. What is this that you've done to us? Um, you, would, you would think that they would be happy for them, that they were victorious over the Midianites who had been oppressing Israel for seven years. That thou calledest us not when thou wentest to fight with the Midianites. And they did chide, that means to contend or wrangle with him sharply or strongly. They were angry. Ephraim, uh, one of the... Uh, what became the largest tribe of the ten northern tribes of Israel. And it seems they were always in a struggle for power. And you see, 
Gideon is of the tribe of Manasseh, which will be brought out here in just a moment. Verse 2, And he, Gideon, said unto them, What have I done now in comparison with you? What you did was much more important than what I was able to accomplish. Is not the gleaning of the grapes of Ephraim better than the vintage of Abizer? Abizer being one of the families of the Manassites and happened to be the family of Gideon. What Gideon's saying here is the leftovers after the harvest of Ephraim are much better than the harvest of Abizer, the fam- one of the families of the uh, Manassites. Now, you see, Gideon could have said, you know, God chose me to be the judge of Israel and to deliver you from the Midianites. And the 300 and I took on 100 and t- killed 120,000 of their armies of 135. But he didn't say that. He thought before he spoke. He said, these guys are to himself, these guys are angry. And if I appease them, if I choose my words wisely, then I can be a peacemaker here rather than a troublemaker. You see, had he said what I just threw out as an example, I was chosen by God, there likely would have been a civil war. Ephraim was not one uh, to uh, take trouble lightly. They were fighters. Verse 3, Gideon continues, God hath delivered unto your hand, speaking to the Ephraimites, the princes of Medan, Oreb and Zeb, and what was I able to do in comparison to you? I did nothing in comparison to what you boys were able to accomplish. Then their anger was abated. That means it ceased toward him when he had said that. Gideon used good psychology on the Ephraimites. He, he, he was tactful. He was a peacemaker rather than a troublemaker. Verse 4, And Gideon came to Jordan and passed over. He and the 300 men, they went from the west side of Jordan to the east side of Jordan. 300 men that were with him, faint, yet pursuing them, pursuing the Midianites and their allies. They they were hungry, and no doubt they were tired after their, their extreme combat. And he said unto the men of Succoth, now you've got to understand, Succoth, we're talking about the people of Israel. Uh, this was, Succoth was allotted to the tribe of Gad on the east side of Jordan. Gideon says to the men of Succoth, Give, I pray you, loaves of bread unto the people that follow me to my men, the 300, for they be faint. And I am pursuing after Zeba and Zalmunna, kings of Medan, kings of the enemy. Now you would think that the people of Succoth would be anxious to help Gideon and his men. I mean, here they're Israel, and Succoth is of Israel. Will the men of Succoth choose their words wisely? Will they think before they speak? Now, Zeba and Zalmunna, by the way, had killed all of Gideon's family. I'm talking brothers of his mother's womb did they kill. So Gideon's got a little bit of an ulterior motive here in catching up with Zeba and Zalmunna. The princes of Succoth respond in verse 6. The princes being the leaders. And the princes of Succoth said, Are the hands of Zeba and Zalmunna now in thine hand? Have you conquered them that we should give bread unto thine army? You see, if we feed you, Zeba and Zalmunna are going to come back and realizing that we helped you if they find out, and they're going to kill us. They didn't choose their words wisely. Verse 7, And Gideon said, Therefore, when the Lord hath delivered Zeba and Zalmunna into mine hand. He didn't say if, 
He said, when? Faith. Then I will tear your flesh with the thorns of the wilderness, that's the desert, and with briars. We'll be back to deal with you later. Gideon's probably thinking, you know, I didn't ask you to come with us and help us. All I asked was for a little refreshment for my men. And he, being Gideon, went up thence to Penuel and spake unto them likewise. My men are tired and hungry. Penuel also, Israelites, give us some bread so we can refresh. And the men of Penuel answered him as the men of Succoth had answered him. Don't put us in jeopardy by asking us to help you. Median will be back. Zeba and Zalmunna will be back and they'll kill us. And he spake also unto the men of Penuel, saying, When I come back again in peace, when I come back unharmed, I will break down this tower, the castle, if you will. Now Zeba and Zalmunna were in Karkor. This is on the east side of Jordan, where they thought they were safe from Gideon. And their host, their armies with them, about 15,000 men. Well, that sounds like a lot of men. Well, it's not so many when they started out with 135,000 men. All that were left of all the host of the children of the east. For there fell 120,000 men that drew sword. And Gideon went up by the way of them that dwelt in the tents, nomadic peoples, in other words, on the east of Noba and Jogbeha, and smote the host, for the host was secure. They thought they were secure. And this surprise attack uh, set them in disarray. And when Zeba and Zalmunna fled, he, being Gideon, pursued after them, and took the two kings of Median, Zeba and Zalmunna, and discomfited all the host. In the Hebrew, this word discomfited means he terrified them. And Gideon, the son of Joash, returned from battle before the sun was up. I think this is a bad translation in the King James Version Bible. Notice the word, words was up are in italics. That means they've been added to supposedly ease the reading in the English language. The word sun in the Hebrew is karez, <clears throat> and, and it, it means that he went up by the ascent of the mountain road, Herez. In fact, it is Moffat chose to translate this latter phrase from the pass of Herez and caught a young man of the men of Succoth, and inquired of him. And he described unto him the princes, or the leaders, of Succoth, and the elders thereof, even threescore and seventeen men. A score is twenty, threescore is sixty, and seventeen is seventy-seven men. Now this is, isn't said to, to mean that this young man sat down and described each one of the 77 leaders of Succoth. Yeah, well, Frank, he's kind of heavy set and got a huge nose. No, that's not what happened here. Described in the Hebrew is he writ or wrote. I think what it means is that he wrote down the names of the 77. You see, Gideon has a score to settle with the, the men, uh, the leaders of Succoth who refused to give bread and refreshment to his men. And he came unto the men of Succoth and said, Behold, Zeba and Zalmunna, whom he had captured, with whom ye did upbraid me. You, you carped at me, saying, Are the hands of Zeba and Zalmunna now in thine hand, that we should give bread unto thy men that are weary? Have you ever seen 77 men sweat? Uh, again, Gideon has a score. It's payback time. And he took the elders of the city and thorns of the wilderness and briars, and with them he taught, in the Hebrew this says, he made to know 
the men of Sukkoth. He made the men of Sukkoth, the leaders, to know that God was with Gideon. And I think what this means is he took uh, thistles and briars uh, still attached to their branches and used them to whip the, the men. And, you know, this was a, a deserved punishment. Not only were they showing contempt for Gideon, uh, Gideon was chosen by God to deliver Israel. And they were showing contempt for the Lord as well. What about the leaders of Penuel? And he beat down the tower of Penuel and slew the men of the city. Then said he unto Zeba and Zalmunna, the kings of Medan, What manner of men were they whom ye slew at Tabor? And they answered, As thou art, so were they. Each one resembled the children of a king. That's funny, now that you ask, they all looked exactly like you. And they're considering uh, Gideon to be the king uh, of Israel, the leader of Israel. Those, those guys that we killed at Tabor look just exactly like you. There was a good reason for that. They were his brothers. And he said, they were my brethren, even the sons of my mother. As the Lord liveth, if ye had saved them alive, I would not slay you. But they didn't. They, they murdered Gideon's brothers at Tabor. And he said unto Jether his first bun, Gideon said to his firstborn, Jether in the smiths means his excellency. It's the same as the word Jethro. Up and slay them. But the youth drew not his sword, for he feared because he was yet a youth. He was only a boy. Then Zeba and Zalmunna said, Rise thou, this to Gideon, and fall upon us. For as the man is, so is his strength. In other words, such strength doesn't belong to a boy, but to a man. And Gideon arose and slew Zeba and Zalmunna and took away the ornaments that were on their camel's necks. They had a habit or tradition of the crescent moons in gold. They used them to adorn uh, their, hor their camel's necks. As Saul became the first man king of Israel, he demonstrated tact in dealing with those who did not accept him as the king of Israel uh, at first. Let's go to 1 Samuel chapter 10 as we continue our study on tact. 1 Samuel chapter 10. We're going to pick it up with Samuel uh, calling the nation of Israel together to anoint a new king, a man king, the first man king of Israel. Chapter 10 of 1 Samuel verse 17 and it reads, and Samuel called the people together unto the Lord to Mizpeh. Now at Mizpeh there was an altar uh, that Samuel had used in the past to offer to the Lord. And said unto the children of Israel, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, I brought up Israel out of Egypt and delivered you out of the hand of the Egyptians and out of the hand of all kingdoms and of them that oppressed you. Gideon delivered uh, the people of Israel from the Medianites. Othniel uh, delivered them from the Canaanites. Deborah also delivered them from the Canaanites at a different time. Samson began to deliver Israel from the Philistines. Over and over, the Lord would raise up an enemy to chastise Israel then he would raise up one to deliver Israel, a judge. Uh, what did he get in return? Rejection. And ye have this day rejected your God, who himself saved you out of all your adversities and your tribulations. And you have said unto him, Nay, no, we don't want a judge. We want a king like the other heathen nations of the world but set a king over us. 
Now therefore present yourselves before the Lord by your tribes and by your thousands. Muster the troops to the altar of the Lord. The Lord's going to let you know who he has chosen to be your man king. And when Samuel had caused all the tribes of Israel to come near, the tribe of Benjamin was taken. This word was taken is moved in. They moved nearer to the altar. When he had caused the tribe of Benjamin to come near by their families, the family of Matri was taken. And Saul, the son of Kish, was taken. This taken by Lot, by the Urim and Thummim uh, that the priest held. And when they sought him, he could not be found. The whole reason they gathered together at Mizpeh was to anoint a new king. God had selected who would be the first man king of Israel, but he's hiding. Uh, Saul, I think, had cold feet, uh, maybe feeling a little bit timid, intimidated at this point. Therefore they inquired of the Lord further through the Urim and Thummim. If the man should yet come hither, the, the man that God chose to be the king. And the Lord answered, Behold, he hath hid himself among the stuff. Now at this time when they traveled, they had to carry everything that they needed with them. And what they would do when they reached the point where they were going to congregate, they would pile all of their possessions in a huge pile and put guards there to guard against somebody stealing it. So what, what's happening here is Saul is hiding himself in the stuff, the pile of belongings. And they ran and fetched him thence. And when he stood among the people, he was higher than any of the people from his shoulders and upward. He was a head taller than everybody else. He, he looked like a king. And Samuel said to all the people, See ye him whom the Lord hath chosen, that there is none like him among all the people. He's tall and he's handsome. And all the people shouted and said, God save the king. In the Hebrew, it's let the king live. Then Samuel told the people the manner of the kingdom, the, the rights, if you will, and the privileges of the monarch, the king, and wrote it in a book and laid it up before the Lord, no doubt in the tabernacle. And Samuel sent all the people away, every man to his house. He established uh, the rights and duties of the man king in relation to Yahweh the Lord, but also in relation to the people. No doubt very similar to what you would find in, in God's word in the book of Moses, Deuteronomy chapter 17, verses 14 through 20. And Saul also went home to Gibeah, and there went with him a band of men whose hearts God had touched, God in control. These were royal escorts ready to serve the king. Not all of Israel, though, is ready to serve Saul, the first man king. Verse 27, But the children of Belial, these are worthless or lawless men, said, How shall this man, referring to Saul, save us. And they despised him and brought him no presents, but he held his peace. They didn't recognize him as the king. Saul held his peace. He didn't say anything. And you know, sometimes when you need to be tactful, uh, it's best to say nothing. And he chose to let it go until a later time. Chapter 11, Saul proves himself uh, to the nation. Then Nahash, the Ammonite, came up. <clears throat> Nahash means snake or serpent, king of the Ammonites, and encamped against Jabesh Gilead. These are people of Israel. And all the men of Jabesh said unto Nahash, Make a covenant with us, and we will serve thee. We don't want to fight. Uh, just make a contract with us and, and we'll serve you. We'll surrender. 
And Nahash the Ammonite answered them, On this condition will I make a covenant with you, that I may thrust out all your right eyes and lay it for a reproach, a disgrace, or a shame upon all Israel. Boy, that doesn't sound like too good a deal to me. Nahash saying, okay, you come out and let me pluck out every one of you's right eye, then you can serve me. I think Nahash is wanting to offend or avenge, I should say, the defeat that Jephthah, one of the other judges of Israel, had put on the Ammonites at an earlier time when they tried to claim land uh, that was on the east side of Jordan. And the elders of Jabesh said unto him, Give us seven days respite. This means let's, let's delay this seven days before we give you a decision. That we may send messengers unto all the coasts or borders of Israel. And then if there be no man to save us, we will come out to thee. Nahash was okay with this. And that's, this means I think Nahash wasn't ready or for war, or he didn't think that anyone was going to come to deliver or save the men and women of Jabesh Gilead. Then came the messengers to Gibeah of Saul. Gibeah would be known as Gibeah of Saul from this time forward. And told the tidings in the ears of the people. And all the people lifted up their voices and wept. It's not a time for weeping, it's a time for action. And behold, Saul came after the herd out of the field. He, he was returning home from a day's work. And Saul said, What aileth the people that they weep? And they told him the tidings of the men of Jabesh. And the Spirit of God came upon Saul when he heard those tidings, and his anger was kindled greatly. Righteous indignation. Always follow the Spirit of God. When you follow the Spirit of God, good things are going to happen. And he took a yoke of oxen and hewed them. He cut them in pieces and sent them throughout all the coast, all the borders of Israel by the hands of messengers, saying, Whosoever cometh not forth after Saul and after Samuel, so shall it be done unto his oxen. And the fear of the Lord fell on the people, and they came out with one consent. They came out as, with one heart, as one man. And when he numbered them in Bezek, the children of Israel were 300,000, and the men of Judah 30,000. Here we see a hint of things to come in the future, dividing the nation of Israel and Judah. Saul would serve as the king over all of Israel, as would David, his successor, as would Solomon, the son of David. But under Solomon's son, Rehoboam, the nation split. Ten tribes went to Jeroboam, the northern tribes, only two tribes remained with Rehoboam, Solomon's son. And they said unto the messengers that came, Thus shall ye say unto the men of Jabesh Gilead, Tomorrow, by the time the sun be hot, around noon, ye shall have help or deliverance. And the messengers came and showed it to the men of Jabesh, and they were glad. They were happy that someone was going to intercede on their behalf. Therefore the men of Jabesh said, Tomorrow we will come out into you. Here they're speaking to Nahash, the king of the Ammonites. And they're deceiving him. In other words, we're going to come out and surrender to you tomorrow. And you shall do with us all that seemeth good unto you. You can pluck out each one of us right eye if it seemed good to you. This is brilliant deception on the part of the people of Jabesh Gilead. The element of surprise in war is very, very valuable. 
And it was so on the morrow that Saul put the people in three companies, three divisions, if you will. And they came into the midst of the host in the morning watch between 3 and 6 a.m., just before daylight, and slew the Ammonites until the heat of the day. And it came to pass that they which remained of the, uh, the Ammonites remained were scattered so that two of them were not left together. Absolutely no chance for them to regroup and counterattack. And the people said unto Samuel, Who is he that said, Shall Saul reign over us? This quoting chapter 10, verse 27, when the men of Belial said, How shall this man save us? Bring the men that they may be put them to death. Wow, that's pretty serious pay for uh, bad-mouthing the king Saul. What will Saul do? Well, he's going to be very tactful. And Saul said, There shall not a man be put to death this day, for today the Lord hath wrought salvation in Israel. I didn't deliver Israel from the Ammonites. The Lord, and, and this is very wise of Saul for a young king. He's giving credit where credit is due. But he's also displaying tact. He's being a peacemaker rather than a troublemaker. Sheba was an enemy of King David. He fled into a city of Abel. And Joab, the, the commander-in-chief of the armies of, of Israel, was hot in pursuit. There was a, the tactfulness of a wise woman saved the city of Abel. Turn with me to 2 Samuel chapter 20. 2 Samuel chapter 20, we're going to pick it up with verse 14. And he, this referring to Joab, went through all the tribes of Israel unto Abel and to Beth Maaca. Beth Maaca means house of oppression located in the northern part of Palestine, but it was part of Israel at this time. And all the Berites, and they were gathered together and went also after him. Quite an army that was following Joab. And they came and besieged him, referring to Sheba, the enemy of David, in Abel of Beth Maaca. And they cast up a bank against the city. They made a mound of dirt and soil so that the wall was not didn't serve any purpose. They could just... Uh, walk up the, the mound of dirt and breach the wall. And it stood in the trench. This means it's, the mound stood against the outmost wall. And all the people that were with Joab battered the wall to throw it down. Now, this is a walled city. There's a lot of people in, within the walled city of Abel. And here, all, and these are people of Israel. And here you have the armies of Israel battering down their gate to come into their city, make war against them. Then cried a wise woman out of the city, Hear, hear, say I pray you unto Joab, come near hither that I may speak with thee. You see, you find the laws of military engagement in Deuteronomy chapter 20, verse 10, and the following verses. And the first thing that you do with the rules of engagement that God established, you allow the city a chance to surrender. And he had, Joab has not allowed the people of Abel a chance to come out and surrender. He's battering down the gates of the city. And when he was come near unto her, Joab to the uh, wise woman, the woman said, Art thou Joab? Question. And he answered, I am he. Then she said unto him, Hear the words of thine handmaid. And he answered, 
I do hear. I'm, I'm listening. Then she spake, saying, They were wont to speak in old time, saying, They shall surely ask counsel at Abel. And so they ended the matter. She's saying, in old times, in times past, the people of Israel said, if you want a wise uh, decision, ask the people of Abel. And then you'll receive a wise, in other words, the inhabitants of Abel were known for their wisdom. And if you'll ask them, you'll get a good decision and the matter will be ended or resolved. 19, the wise woman continues, I am one of them that are peaceable and faithful in Israel. I, I'm one of you. Thou seekest to destroy a city and a mother of Israel. Cities, walled cities, were known as mother cities. The small villages surrounding the larger city, the mother were called the daughters of Israel. Why wilt thou swallow up the inheritance of the Lord? We didn't ask Sheba and his crud to come here, but you're trying to destroy us right along with Sheba. And Joab answered and said, Far be it, far be it from me that I should swallow up or destroy. In other words, you're right. She reminded him of the rules of engagement uh, when going to war. The matter is not so, Joab continues. It's, it's not exactly like you said, but a man of Mount Ephraim, Sheba, the son of Bichri by name, hath lifted up his hand against the king, even against David. Deliver him only, and I will depart from the city. And the woman said unto Joab, Behold, his head shall be thrown to thee over the wall. Then the woman went into all the people in her wisdom, and they cut off the head of Sheba, the son of Bichri, and cast it out to Joab. And he, Joab, blew a trumpet, and they retired from the city. Every man to his tent, they all went home, in other words, and Joab returned to Jerusalem, unto the king. This tax of this wise woman saved her entire city. She, she chose her words wisely and she was successful in convincing Joab. The words you choose are able to turn away wrath or they can stir up anger. Turn with me to Proverbs. Just after Psalms, you've got a book of Proverbs. We're going to pick it up with Proverbs chapter 15, verse 1, and it reads, A soft answer turneth away wrath, but grievous words stir up anger. Choose your words wisely. Be a peacemaker, not a troublemaker. Soft words turneth away wrath. Verse 2, the tongue, or the conversation, the words, if you will, of the wise useth knowledge aright, but the mouth of fools poureth out foolishness. Don't ever expect to hear wisdom coming forth from the mouth of a fool. All you're going to hear is foolishness. The eyes of the Lord are in every place. Why? Because he's omnipresent, meaning he's everywhere at the same time. Beholding the evil and the good. He knows everything and he keeps very good books. I'm always amazed or amused, better word, when someone says, I'm going to hide this from God. You can't hide anything from God because he is omnipresent. A wholesome tongue or a soothing tongue is a tree of life. Moffat translates the tree of life is, means life and peace. But perverseness or wild words therein is a breach in the spirit. Wild words can 
damage your spirit. A fool despiseth his father's instruction, but he that regardeth reproof is prudent, has, has good common sense. In the house of the righteous is much treasure, or ample treasure, enough. There's always enough to eat. Uh, there's always enough of everything. But in the revenues, or the profit or gain of the wicked, is trouble. In the New Testament, Jesus would say it's easier for the, a camel to enter through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter heaven. He was talking about someone who was rich with ill-gotten gains. The lesson there, you got to get rid of the ill-gotten gains before you can enter heaven. But the, the gains or the profit of the wicked is always trouble. The lips or conversation of the wise dispersed knowledge, but the heart or the mind of the foolish doth not so. You won't find any stability. Uh, they always go with whichever way the wind is blowing from. The sacrifice or the offering of the wicked is abomination. It's disgusting to the Lord. But the prayer of the upright is his delight. God delights in the prayer of the righteous. That's you. The way of the wicked is an abomination unto the Lord. But he loveth him that followeth after righteousness. That's those who try to do what is right. Correction or instruction is grievous unto him that forsaketh the way, and he that hateth reproof or correction shall die. The way is Jesus Christ. If you hate uh, his correction, you will die. We're talking spiritually. Hell and destruction, uh, Moffat translates, death and the world of the dead are before the Lord. They're, they're laid open to the Lord. How much more than the hearts of the children of men. Proof that God knows your heart. He knows your mind. A scorner or a scoffer loveth not one that reproveth him, neither will he go unto the wise. He doesn't want to be corrected. He'll go through life making the same mistakes over and over again. A merry heart, a happy heart, maketh a cheerful countenance, but by sorrow of the heart the spirit is broken. You can tell by looking at a person, by just reading their face, whether they're a happy person or whether their spirit has been broken. The heart of him that hath understanding seeketh knowledge, but the mouth of fools feedeth on foolishness. Doesn't know the difference between knowledge and foolishness. All the days of the afflicted, this word afflicted means depressed, are evil or hard, but he that is of a merry heart hath a continual feast. You know, life is sometimes pretty well what you make of it. And I know that there, there's a mental illness called depression. It's very real. Some people need help. A lot of people bring trouble on themselves, though. Their, their attitude is depressed. They, they, they don't go through life happy. They go through life sad. Better is little with fear of the Lord or reverence of the Lord than great treasure and trouble therewith. Sometimes great treasure can bring worry to you. What, what, what if somebody steals my treasure? What, what if I lose my treasure? Better is a dinner of herbs where love is than a stalled or a corn-fed ox and hatred therewith. It's better to eat just vegetables where there's love and peace in a home than it is to eat steak and potatoes. And I'm a steak and potato man myself, but you know, vegetables in peace are better than a steak with a side of strife and conflict. 
Now, if you can find a way to have the steak and peace, that is great. In the early years of Christianity, it was dangerous to be a Christian. It was important for Paul and others to be tactful. They had to choose their words wisely. You know, when you, you tell somebody their religion is false, you better be ready for some blowback. Be tactful. In conclusion, turn with me to Acts chapter 19. Just after the Gospels, you Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, you've got the book of Acts. We're going to chapter 19. Let's pick it up with verse 21. And after these things were ended, what things? Well, they burned 50,000 uh, pieces of silver worth of what was called you know, curious arts in verse 19, if you back up a couple of verses, that were witchcraft uh, and false religions, in other words. They were making headway. Paul purposed or resolved in the spirit when he had passed through Macedonia and Achaia, that's Greece, to go to Jerusalem, saying, after I have been there, I must go to Rome. Now, Paul's father was a Roman. Acts chapter 22, verse 27, will document. So he sent unto Macedonia, that's in Greece, uh, two of them that ministered unto him, Timotheus, that's Timothy, and Erastus, but he himself stayed in Asia for a season. Many were receiving the truth. And at the same time, there arose no small stir about that way. What way? Christianity. Uh, Christianity was causing uh, tumult. It was disturbing the ways of those who uh, had, were worshiping idols, things made with the hands. For a certain man named Demetrius, a silversmith, which made silver shrines for Diana, brought no small gain unto the craftsmen. It was big business. They were making, raking the money in, making these little silver uh, temples, if you will, to Diana. Diana was a multi-breasted uh, god of these people, whom he called together with the workmen of like occupation. He called all the silversmiths together and said, Sirs, you know that by this craft we have our wealth. We're getting filthy rich making these little silver shrines. Moreover, you see and hear that none, not alone at Ephesus, but almost throughout all Asia, this Paul hath persuaded and turned away much people, saying that they be no gods which are made with hands. Paul is hurting our business. He's telling people that they aren't gods if a silversmith makes it with his hands. Sometimes the truth hurts. So that not only this our craft is in danger to be set at naught, but also that the temple of the great goddess Diana should be despised. We're not only losing our little silver, our business, we're losing our religion. And her magnificence, magnificence should be destroyed right along with our business, whom all Asia and the world worshipeth. Well, not all Asia and the world worshipped Diana. Paul was not one to sugarcoat anyone. He would tell them, you're not worshiping God. You have a false religion. And when they heard these sayings, they were full of wrath and cried out, saying, Great is Diana of the Ephesians. Pull out the tent. It's revival time for Diana. And the whole city was filled with confusion, filled with babel. And having caught or seized Gaius and Aristarchus, men of Macedonia, Paul's companions in travel, Christians in other words, they rushed with one accord into the theater. This was a 
amphitheater, that the, the ruins of this theater, amphitheater, uh, remain unto this day. And when Paul would have entered into the people, he saw this as an opportunity to do some teaching. The disciples suffered him not. They didn't allow Paul to go in. They saw it as a very dangerous situation, very perceptively. And certain of the chief of Asia, which were his friends, Paul's friends, sent unto him, desiring him that he should not adventure himself into the theater. Don't go into the theater, that's trouble. Some, meanwhile, back in the amphitheater, some therefore cried one thing and some another, for the assembly was confused. And the more part, the majority in other words, knew not wherefore they were come together. They didn't know why they were there. Now that's confusion. And they drew Alexander out of the multitude, the Jews putting him forward, the, the people of Judah, in other words, to plea their cause. And Alexander beckoned with the hand, he motioned with his hand, and would have made his defense unto the people. He was getting ready to address them. And he'd sure better choose his words wisely. He better be tactful. He's in a potentially dangerous crowd. You know, you should always know your surroundings and know when danger is near. And what they knew too was that there's a group of Roman soldiers who are resting nearby and they don't want any trouble from these people. And of course, being Romans, they didn't believe in Diana. They didn't believe in uh, Jesus Christ. They believed in Caesar. Caesar was their God. But when they knew that he was a Jew, referring to Alexander, he was of Judah. In other words, he was with Paul, all with one voice <clears throat> about the space of two hours, cried out, great is Diana of the Ephesians. We've got a queen of Babylon prayer meeting going on. And when the town clerk, this is a, a scribe or a secretary of the Ephesians, had appeased the people, Moffat translated this, he calmed them down. He was a peacemaker. Uh, this town clerk was tactful. He said, ye men of Ephesus, what man is there that knoweth not how the city of the Ephesians is a worshiper of the great goddess Diana. Everybody knows that. And of the image, this is the image he's referring to is Zeus <clears throat> of Greek mythology, which fell down from Jupiter. And again, the Roman soldiers are resting and watching and taking all this in. Seeing then that these things cannot be spoken against, Diana and Zeus cannot be spoken against, you ought to be quiet and to do nothing rashly. Settle down. Don't let this confusion work you into a, a fervor. Think before you speak. Be tactful. For ye have brought hither these men, referring to Gaius and Alexander and Aristarchus, which are neither robbers of churches nor yet blasphemers of your goddess. They, they haven't caused any offense to you. They haven't robbed you. They're, they've been tactful, peacemakers. Wherefore, if Demetrius and the craftsmen which are with him, Demetrius the silversmith, remember, have a matter against any man, the law is open, the court days are kept, and there are deputies. Let them implead or bring to account one another. These deputies were uh, Roman pro-councils. There, there was a position in the Roman hierarchy called a council, and under them were pro-councils. Often pro-councils were previously had been councils but they served as a layer, if you will, uh, of court for the people. Verse 39, But if ye inquire anything concerning other matters, 
It shall be determined in a lawful assembly, not in a confusion-filled amphitheater. For we are in danger to be called in question for this day's uproar. Those Roman soldiers over there are watching and taking note of you acting like a bunch of fools and, and being confused. There being no cause whereby we may give an account of this concourse. If I had to explain to those Roman soldiers what's going on here, I wouldn't be able to do it. I mean, there's so much confusion, you don't even know why you're here. And when he had thus spoken, he dismissed the assembly. God took care of Paul and the others that were with him uh, through this very tactful town clerk. You know, as you go through life, there are situations that arise where you can either be a peacemaker or you can be a troublemaker. And the words you choose decide which. Let's go to his throne. Yahweh, Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word, Father, that, that shows us how to be pleasing to you. Not only that, Father, it shows us how to go through life and, and to live life in a peaceful manner rather than having trouble in our lives all the time, Father. We pray for peace. Uh, we pray for peace of mind, Father. Be with us this day, Father. Let everything else we do this day be to the honor and glory of thy name in Yeshua, Jesus' precious name. Amen. God's Word with understanding will change your life. We hope you have enjoyed studying God's Word here on the Shepherd's Chapel Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Dennis Murray. If you would like to receive more information concerning Shepherd's Chapel, you may request our free introductory offer. Our introductory offer contains the Mark of the Beast CD, our monthly newsletter with a written Bible study, a CD catalog, and a list of written reference works available through Shepherd's Chapel. To request our free introductory offer by telephone, call 800-643-4645, 24 hours a day. You may also request our introductory offer by writing to Shepherd's Chapel, P.O. Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. Once again, that's Shepherd's Chapel, P.O. Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. We invite you to join us for the next in-depth Bible study each weekday at the same time. Thank you for watching today's program, and God bless you.